France's Emmanuel Macron no longer holds bragging rights to the title of Europe's fresh face. That distinction now the property of Sebastian Kurz, leader of Austria's Christian Democrats, and the winner of Sunday's snap general election. At 31, eight years the junior of Macron. So uh, what are the new ideas behind this new face? In a campaign where the dominant theme was immigration and how to curb it, Kurz openly embracing the prospect of a coalition with the far right, which garnered a whopping one quarter of the vote. Will it push Austria into the illiberal camp of the likes of Hungary and Poland? The first time the Freedom Party was in government, that was in 2000 in Vienna, and there was outrage at the time and diplomatic boycotts by EU states. Times have certainly changed, and identity politics have indeed gone mainstream. Is the example of Austria the way to go for center-right parties in places like France and Germany and elsewhere? What are Europe's new political fault lines? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at, well, what could be the new face of Europe? And uh, joining us uh, from uh, uh, joining us from uh, uh, the uh, Sciences Po, the French Political Science Institute, François Lafont. Good evening. Thank you for being with us. I want to thank as well Hannah Starman, uh, who uh, works on European policy for Emmanuel Macron's En Marche Party. Is that the right way to say it? Well, I'm I'm in charge of um, work locally, locally at the policy. local level. But you're the Europe person uh, for the for the Paris branch, shall we say. Uh, joining us from New York City, journalist uh, Sasha polikov suransky author of Go Back to Where You Came From, The Backlash Against Immigration and the Fate of Western Democracy. Many thanks for joining us from New York City. I also want to thank uh, for joining us uh, from uh, Traunstein in Germany. Uh, that is journalist and commentator Roland Tichy, editor-in-chief of Tichy's Einblick. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. The France, nice to see you. Nice to see you. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter. Hashtag F24 debate. They're still counting ballots cast from abroad before the week's out. Austria's president is poised to ask Sebastian Kurz to form that next government, making him not only Europe, but the world's youngest leader. Claire Rush has more. 31-year-old Sebastian Kurz is set to become the world's youngest leader, with immigration topping his agenda. I can promise you today that we will do everything in our power to put an end to migrants' abuse of social welfare. Our social security system should be accessible to all those who need it. In 2015, thousands of migrants flooded across Austria's borders. Then Foreign Minister Kurz criticized the open-door migration policy of German Chancellor Angela Merkel. He reintroduced border controls in 2016, effectively shutting down the Balkan migrant route, a hardline stance he may well implement as chancellor. Being saved from the Mediterranean Sea shouldn't be considered as an entry ticket to Europe. We must be in solidarity with Italy, but within reason. We must help Italy close the Mediterranean migrant route. Kurtz is treading on ground associated with the far-right Freedom Party, or FPO, which scored around 26% meaning a possible entry in government for the party, whose leader has already demanded the Interior and Justice Ministry portfolios. But some in Kurtz's Conservative Party worry about a potential coalition with the far right. I prefer a coalition with the Social Democrats rather than the far right. Neighboring countries have been watching this election closely, particularly Hungary's Viktor Orban, a nationalist who has adopted a hardline stance on immigration. Yeah, by the way, the, the Social Democrats uh, actually increased uh, their vote share, uh, but only marginally. Meanwhile, the Greens, after a split, collapsed, if you compare with the 2013 election, and the far right surging by five and a half percent. So that's the uh, FPE party. Uh, there you have uh, what could be the projection. Of course, there's uh, all the postal ballots that still haven't been counted, some 700,000 of them. So there could be minor changes to all this, François Lafont. What's the secret of Sebastian Kurz's success? Maybe the secret is uh, a new guy. Uh, I mean, he has been able to reshape a little bit uh, an old party and to uh, make sure that the people think that is uh, bringing something new. That's first. And second, maybe about the uh, a certain number of uh, very tough proposal on immigration, because immigration was one of the most uh, debated uh, uh, topic during the, the campaign. So you've got a rich country, 
uh, Austria because the economic growth is, is good. There is no economic problem in a certain sense, but uh, there was uh, this migration waves uh, uh, last year and two years ago with uh, 130,000 people coming in the country. So that means in percentage, this is more than in Germany. And the people fear that maybe we have to tackle and to manage better the situation borders at the European level and in Austria in particular. Uh, it's a fresh face, Roland Tichy. Does he have new ideas? Well, the style of his campaign <clears throat> was very similar to Emmanuel Macron. So this is maybe a new style through Europe that as a young leader who takes an old party and makes it into a movement. His conservative party is no longer a classical continental party. It's more styled to a movement uh, as it was in the success of Macron in France. This is the first thing. And the second thing is, he pointed, as uh, just was said, uh, he pointed with his fingers uh, to the most important problem Austrians feel, uh, and this is migration. Uh, the country has took so many people, uh, and there is no end in sight. And so um, he has uh, um, the chance, uh, and he promises, uh, to change the situation. By the way, um, uh, France especially does not take in any, uh, um, in any idea as much uh, refugees as Austria did. So I guess uh, we should understand those people that they fear they are feeling they are overrun by migration, which is uh, uncontrolled. Uh, in uh, Western uh, Europe. Uncontrolled is something we, we, we could ask our panel about. But Hannah Starman, it's true that we did hear the French president in his interview Sunday night uh, say that there would be firmer policies when it came to sending back uh, people who are asylum seekers, who, are, who don't have uh, papers here in France, sending them back if they commit any sort of crime and, and uh, kicking them out of the country, expelling them. Uh, do you agree uh, that, uh, Ron Tichy, that this comparison is a good one between Sebastian Kurz and, and, and Emmanuel Macron? I don't think exactly, there is because, uh, any... Uh, um, uh, Hannah, Hannah Starman, Hannah Starman. I don't think there's any good comparison between the two men. They happen to both be young and um, have a certain style uh, in, in communications, but I don't think they share the same ideas at all. Sebastian Kurz um, has appropriated a lot of the far-right discourse, which allowed him to be elected with such an important majority. Um, but um, and Emmanuel Macron was elected on a very pro-European discourse, which is a, a major difference between the two men. As far as the immigration is concerned, um, there, there is international law. Uh, asylum seekers are granted asylum on the basis of um, Geneva Conventions. If they commit a serious crime, and France, I don't think, is the only country that considers this measure, they can be sent back. That's true. All right. So uh, the, the issue of uh, 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 politicians appearing tough when it comes to migrants is uh, one thing. But, of course, there was during the campaign an anti-Islam uh, stance. It was taken uh, not just uh, by the ruling Christian, uh, by the Christian Democrats in Austria, but also by the far-right Freedom Party. Founded by former Nazis in the 1950s, its leader, Heinz Christian Strache, flirted with neo-Nazism in his youth. His views have changed. But he is Eurosceptic, enjoys the support of an alliance with President Putin's party, and wants the lifting of EU sanctions on Moscow. Over the years, his party moving away from anti-Semitism to focus squarely on an anti-Islam message. No, Islam is not part of Austria, my dear friends. We want to prevent the Islamization of Austria, and we will achieve that, dear friends. Sasha Polakov Saransky, uh, do you see a coalition then between Sebastian Kurz and uh, the far right? I think that's a real risk, and we'll have to see what happens when they actually form a coalition. But if you look at some other European countries, it's instructive, because even if there isn't a coalition, there's a risk that these ideas become the new normal. 
one can understand why Kurtz ran on the platform that he did. He was quite successful and he clearly gained some voters who had voted for the far right in the past and moved to the center and voted for him. But the risk when these parties in the center behave that way is that the ideas that came from the far right that they've now adopted become the new center and the new mainstream in that society. And we've seen this in other countries in Europe. In Denmark especially, you have a center-right government that isn't in formal coalition with the far right, but the far right's ideas often influence policy on very many issues. And you saw this in the Dutch election as well. The center-right prevailed, but they also adopted some of the hard-nosed rhetoric of Geert Wilders' far-right PVV during the Dutch election. And so the risk in Austria is similar, is that once you adopt these ideas in a campaign, they don't go away. Uh, Roland Tischy, uh, do you agree with that, that uh, it, it'll be no longer the center-right, but the hard-right uh, in Austria that'll be in power if they have a coalition deal uh, with, uh, with the uh, FPÖ? First of all, <clears throat> it is true that the FPÖ is a center-right party, and it is was founded, as was said, in the 50s. It's, uh, let's call, the mother of all populist uh, parties in Europe. So uh, it is a very old party, uh, and it has formed many coalitions. It has formed coalitions with the SPU, so uh, so-called the Social Democrats, and it has on a countryside level of Burgenland in these days a coalition with the uh, SPÖ. So uh, in Austria it's uh, common sense that everybody can uh, form a government with every other guy and um, uh, the SPÖ should leave a coalition with FPÖ if uh, they accuse them for being too far to the right. But uh, the thing is, uh, let's go back to the numbers. As we heard before, uh, uh, um, Macron will take 10,000 uh, refugees. Austria, which is a country of just 8 million inhabitants, let's say it is uh, not even as big as Paris, has taken 130,000. And this is the background of the situation um, that people feel uh, uh, there has to be done something, that there has to be uh, reorganized, uh, um, uh, 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 organizing uh, migration. But you don't have Emmanuel Macron claiming that uh, there's an Islamization of France or Europe. Pardon me, I didn't get this question. You, you don't have Emmanuel Macron claiming that there's an Islamization of France or Europe. Oh. I just, I just pointed to the figures and I wanted to explain why in Austria uh, the elections came as they have come yesterday. Uh, and I guess this is uh, the situation. And uh, people feel, are feeling in this very short period of times that they took so many refugees uh, that their country changes in a way they do not like, and uh, um, politics have, has to has to cope with the situation. And uh, uh, Kurz uh, is uh, came to his uh, victory by pointing his fingers to this problem and by um, assuring that he will stop migration. And this is not uh, any anti-Islamic situation. But uh, he has to do something um, with his people's wishes uh, in a situation which is very hard to stand in Austria. If you go to any small country, you see the changing of uh, these, this society within one or two years. And uh, so um, they are in the same situation as Hungary or as the Czechs or as the Polish uh, who, who want to discuss the question, is migration with such a speed uh, as it has come during the last two years, is this really what the country needs? Fr François Lafont. Well, I, I, I'm hearing what, what, uh, what uh, our colleague is saying, but uh, we could say first uh, on the historical period we have seen already the extreme right and it was not migration a consequence of the migration wave i mean uh, in the, 2000 uh, with either it was already something in uh, in uh, in the political landscape uh, two of course the uh, a big number in uh, and i mentioned it uh, in austria but let's see this is eight percent of the population i'm not sure that in france if you uh, take into account the muslim uh, community uh, there are less than uh, this uh, percentage so 
of course, this is something new in Austria, and we have to understand and to see how to tackle better the situation. But uh, they have also to be more open to the diversity, and we see that in uh, in uh, Hungary, we see that in Poland. I mean, the, the Visegrad country. Uh, have a problem with their identity. And they consider that the one who is not like them is somebody has to do not stay in their country. That's something which is not good for Europe. And this is not Europe. All right. Is it just the Visegrad country? Something we'll be asking our panel when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're talking about the new face of Europe, the newest one, which is, well, the 31-year-old chancellor in waiting in Austria after a snap general election, 31 years old, uh, Christian Democrat Sebastian Kurz, who is uh, pondering a coalition with the far right. Uh, with us to talk about it, François Lafont teaches at uh, the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. Hannah Starman of uh, Emmanuel Macron's En Marche party uh, joining us uh, from New York City. Uh, journalist Sasha Polikov Saransky, the author of Go Back to Where You Came From, The Backlash Against Immigration and the Fate of Western Democracy. In Bavaria, we're joined by journalist and commentator Roland Tishy. And for part two of our discussion, we're pleased to welcome from Vienna, Barbara Kolm, founding director of the Austria Economics uh, Center. Uh, Barbara, thank you for being with us. In part one of our discussion, uh, the panelists wondering aloud, uh, is it still a Christian Democratic Party uh, if it takes on too much of the platform of the far right? Uh, is the CDU still going to, uh, the CDU, I'm thinking of Germany, uh, is, uh, the, uh, is the party uh, of uh, uh, Christian Kurz going to tack too far to the right? Well, first of all, thank you for the for the invitation. First of all, I would like to state that uh, the Freedom Party that is not is has moved to the center. It's a center right party, and uh, the ÖVP is a very conservative or uh, is a is a conservative center party, also center right. So if we look it, at it, the you policy, say it's moved to the center, but we heard a clip earlier from. Uh, Mr. Strache, the head of the uh, Freedom Party, uh, which he basically talked of an Austria overrun by uh, Islam. Well, of course, uh, I mean, we, we have seen issues in, in, in Vienna and in Austria uh, with uh, radical Islamism. Uh, and I think this is definitely an issue that we have these days in Austria, thanks to the migration crisis and the lack of integration. Uh, because uh, when critical people started to say migration, immigration, yes, but with integration, this integration part was left out. And then all of a sudden, issues and problems arose. And those have been neglected way too long. And the only party that has mentioned this and that has pointed out to those problems were the Freedom Party for a very long time. And only recently, when the pressure from the people, namely being a discontent with the politics that the big coalition, the conservative and the social democrats, had done in the past couple of years, only then, um, uh, also the ÖVP, especially Sebastian Kurz, uh, swung and turned to the to the center right because uh, obviously, uh, otherwise, they would not have been elected. Uh, let, me, let, let me bring in let me bring in Sasha Polukov Saransky on this because um, there's the Secretary General of uh, the Conservative Party here in France. His name is Bernard Accoyer, who's quoted in Le Monde over the weekend as saying, "We belong to a European civilization, and there is a French culture. We shouldn't abandon our bearings." When he's saying that, do you take that at face value, or is that a dog whistle message to far right voters? I think it's a fair argument to make, but when it comes from politicians, it often is a dog whistle. And going back to what you raised earlier in the segment, there's this civilizational rhetoric going on throughout Europe. And you hear it in France, you hear it in Austria, you hear it from the IFD in Germany, framing Islam as this irreconcilable force that threatens European culture. 
And as the other guests on the show have mentioned, there are real problems with immigration, and there are very serious problems with integration, and the left and the center left in all of these countries deserve some blame for not addressing these issues for so long. But that doesn't excuse this sort of civilizational war rhetoric that we hear from so many politicians on the center right and on the far right. And what that does is it turns Muslim fellow citizens in these countries and new migrants who are coming from, from Muslim countries and who are often refugees with legitimate claims, it turns them into enemies. And I think these politicians bear some responsibility for provoking the reactions that we're seeing from voters. Yes, voters are upset. That, and yes, they have some legitimate grievances, but we've also seen a lot of opportunistic politicians from Le Pen in France to the far right in Austria and Germany to Wilders in Holland to the Danish People's Party who are using this anger and manipulating these voters by bringing the civilizational argument in. And it is ratcheting up the rhetoric and the tension, and it is not good for any of these societies. And as the centrist parties take on more of this rhetoric, my fear is that we're going to see a lot of these countries start to move in that direction and that that is going to become a mainstream position rather than a fringe position. A mainstream position rather than a fringe position. Let's take a look at just one of the reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. If Austria stands with Poland, Hungary on forced immigration, this will make Merkel's plan hit a wall, grind to a halt, the destruction of the EU, uh, perhaps stating very strongly the case there, uh, Hannah Starman. Nonetheless, when Emmanuel Macron was elected, after those Dutch elections where the far right was thwarted, people said, oh, uh, the far right has plateaued. But uh, you just heard there what uh, a moment ago Sasha Polukov saransky was saying. Uh, there is this uh, uh, um, going mainstream of far right ideas which continues unabated. I would just like to return for, for one second to the numbers. I don't think the numbers are a problem. Lebanon hosts two million refugees for a country of four million. It's not about numbers. And I think that um, um, our colleague who spoke about uh, civilizational rhetoric is Lebanese correct. don't see it that way, though. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a particularly dire situation in cities like Tripoli in Lebanon. No, I understand. But it's, it's not about numbers. It's about uh, this so-called clash of civilizations. It's because these people are Muslim. It's because they come from countries that are not Christian. That's what uh, a lot of uh, Visegrad and not only countries have said. Poland, for example, said we're happy to, to accept Ukrainian refugees, but we're not accepting Muslim refugees because this, this, this is also about the myth that I think is very present in Eastern Europe of, of a homogenous country, of a country that uh, where the population is, is untainted with foreign, uh, foreign um, impact and, and foreign um, foreign peoples, foreign religion, which is not necessarily true. Now, Austria, in this respect, has a particular history as well of, of the clash of the <clears throat> Austrian Empire and the Ottoman Empire and the fact that, that Austria was the country who stopped the Turks. And it's also the myth that they keep going back to when they close the borders. It was yeah, Austria is the, the one country that will stop the invasion of Islam in the in Europe that is going to, to, to present this barrier. Um, but again, this is not the only discourse. This is one of the possible discourses. Uh, President Macron had the exactly opposite discourse. It had the discourse that Europe <coughs> is a civilization, that there is a um, a multicultural civilization. There is a saying. multicultural civilization, and that uh, Islam Islam is is part of Europe. It's always been part of Europe as much as other religions. Barbara Cohn, I, I would I not think agree we with have this. To, we, this is this is way too easy to sim uh, This is simplifying things, and it, it's not as simple as uh, as as it was just demonstrated. I think on the one hand, if say a center center right group points out to the problems to that we that we have seen in the past with radical islamism and with the lack of integration uh, then all of a sudden they are labeled as ultra right and far right if the social democrats for example uh, 
as they did in the Austrian campaign in, in a couple of weeks ago, also addressed the problem and finally said, yes, we have made a mistake by allowing too many into the country without integrating and without having the right resources for, for the issue, for the problem, to tackle it. That nobody says they all of a sudden are ultra right. And I think that it would be too easy to just say because of migration, certain issues, uh, the, the, the center and the center right are on, the, on, the, on a level now, on the same thing. I think this is not the case. And of course, I would like to come back to our colleague who mentioned um, the, that that we have always had a, a Christian uh, background, the values, the European values that are there, that are in common there. Of course they are there, but we are also an open society. And being an open society, we also have to take um, responsibility also for the next generation. And the issue that was in the Austrian election debate was the issue of the costs that we bear and that we have um, for all those immigrants and migrants and whether it was responsible for our own Austrian people in need. And I think it's just a, a sheer discussion on how to solve structural problems. And if you, if we look at the numbers... How to solve so, so, structural problems, not, not a clash of civilizations, as it were? I would, say I would not. I would not right say it as a clash of uh, civilization. Of course, there are demonstrants on, on both sides of the spectrum, on the ultra left and on the ultra right. Um, but the clash of it was not debated as the clash of civilization. It was, as a matter of fact, it was very factual. It was on numbers. Can we afford it? Can we do it? Can we stick also to our roots? All right, before, because, before I turn to, to Roland Tichy on this, Angela Merkel was asked about the results in neighboring Austria. She congratulated Sebastian Kurz, and she was asked whether the rise of the far right and the backlash against migrants will set the agenda on the European stage. Here's what she had to say. I think that... I believe the question of how we should fight the causes of migration, the issue of the need to agree to a deal with Turkey, these points are not so contentious. In a way, it is more a question of rhetoric. If Sebastian Kurz becomes Chancellor of Austria, we will discuss these matters in more detail. But I do not have major concerns. Today we have said, and I say this time and again, we must solve the problems. And we must look at what we have achieved and what we have not. Ron Tishy, what do you make of her tone? Well, uh, let's go back to the discussion. It is a question of numbers. It is the question of France, by example, would take within two years 800,000 All right, if it's a question of numbers, then why is it that Poland, which has so few of these migrants, is yes. so adamant we, about it? We are just talking about Austria. Mm. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it's not a question of discourse. It's a question of numbers, and it's a question of how you can run your social security system with such a big number of people who cannot work. And the social security system in Austria is very high and attracts many people. And it is fair to say that they cannot stand their quality of uh, social security systems if they cannot integrate those people and they cannot, as it is a question of numbers. And uh, as far as I can see, is uh, Angela Merkel not that far away? Because Germany did in the same way take so many refugees that were invited by her. Now she got the problem of housing, of uh, uh, paying money to them, of integrating them, and it's very difficult. And just to say, to point with the fingers to the East German countries and say, oh no, they are not European, I cannot agree uh, to you, Sasha. There is no law in Europe that there has to be a certain number uh, or a certain percentage of 
uh, Muslim migrants to be a European country or to not to be. I think it's in the right of the hands um, of the people of Austria, of Poland, and of the Czech Republic uh, to discuss about, about their migration. There is no law that they have to take as much as France had in his history of 100 years of uh, colonization and decolonization. All right, before I get to, to, before I get to Sasha polakov saransky François Lafont, your thoughts on uh, th this argument and the way it's playing out geographically? No, I understand that this is a problem and we have to tackle that. I mean, we have to face the point of, one, we have to decide how many migrants should come to Europe. Uh, for sure, the refugees, uh, there is no quota possible because we have to <clears> be open to them. So the question is, we have to distinguish between the refugees and the economic migrants. That's one thing. But we have to have common rules at the European level, which is not the case. So, of course, this current situation show how the European Union should do better in the future, concerning the control of the borders, making sure that we have a common asylum system, making sure that we have a certain number of capacity to integrate the migrants. For sure, there is a question of, of integration. And you cannot say that in two years, the people arriving will speak German, will be able to uh, find a, a job in the economic so in the society. So we need time to do that. And the Austrian people have to understand that it needs time. Even in France, we have some problem of integration. We know this is difficult, but we have no choice. First, because of the demography of these countries. I mean, Germany and Austria, they are old countries. They they will need migrants for their pension system and so on. So we have to be a bit more articulated and introduce complexity in our thinking, exactly like President Macron tried to do in his way. Barbara Cohn. Sorry for interrupting, but you know, there, there, this is again something that you uh, compare apples with peers. Um, first of all, and this was mentioned by the colleague who spoke before you, Sasha, um, and, and I'm completely in line with him, because if we look at our national budgets, we simply cannot afford we cannot afford it uh, with our social exp uh, with our social security system to invite more people and to pay for more. We are at drastic high debt levels and this uh, i mean we would we would have to be bailed out by the next country if we continue to do so because this is irresponsible so this was the question within the debate within the campaigns of this of the center and the center right because they asked this very rationally how can we afford this? And if we do not find a solution to that, I don't think that more integration on the European level means centrally planned out of Brussels will help us. I think we should allow the respective countries to find solutions on their own and not blame them. Because as you mentioned, the Polish said, no, we don't take any. The Swedes took many, the Germans took many, and Austria did. And we are now in trouble. And look at what is happening in Italy. I mean, this is the next problem that will, uh, that will let, arise let me, bring in, let me bring in Sasha polukov saransky on this. Uh, in researching your book, because you've just heard two different arguments, one saying it's uh, this anti-immigrant backlash, it's uh, a question of practicalities, of whether you can afford it or not. And the other argument that it's, well, it's an identity issue, it's an ideological issue. What did you find in researching your book? Well, I think that you've pointed to the two key issues. And the issue for me is that politicians are conflating these issues in a way that allows them to gain votes. I don't disagree with my colleagues on the panel who say that at a certain level and a certain speed of migration, it's unsustainable and it's unaffordable. I would agree with that. What bothers me, and quite frankly what frightens me, is the way that the practical and economic rhetoric gets mixed with the civilizational anti-Islamic rhetoric. And here I think is where we see a total contrast between France under Macron and some of these other countries. He has not fallen prey to that. If you recall the final presidential debate with Le Pen a few days before the election, he said to her face, I will not 
indulged this fear and called her the high priestess of fear. So he pushed back against that rhetoric and said that you can have a tough anti-terrorism policy, you can have a serious integration policy, but you don't have to adopt that sort of rhetoric. So that's where I disagree with my colleagues on this panel. By all means, you have to limit numbers, you have to limit the speed. What's interesting to me also is in the CDU in Germany, for instance, even some of the people who objected to Angela Merkel's policy within the party, they don't indulge in the same sort of civilizational rhetoric that targets Muslims, that blames Muslims, and that riles up voters by talking about Muslims as a threat to European culture. They say, yes, it's going to be a challenge, and yes, it's going to be hard to integrate people, and no, we didn't agree with this policy. But I think that that is a fundamentally different approach to the people who go along with this. And that is the danger in a lot of these countries now, is too many people are adopting this rhetoric in order to win votes. And Sasha, you're in New York, you're in the United States, and I just want to ask you, because uh, you're in a country which's always welcomed immigrants and that has always had freedom of religion. Why, is the, why are the same arguments a, a, appearing where you are? Well, Trump highlighted these issues in a way that targeted certain voters in certain parts of the country where there has been a loss of jobs, economic dislocation, a lot of post-industrial areas, including the state I come from, Michigan. And he won there, and he won in Wisconsin, and he won in Pennsylvania. And it was a very savvy campaign, and they managed to find voters Is in Is it the same conversation as in Europe? It's similar. It's not the exact same thing. Obviously, we have a two-party system in this country. We don't have coalitions. Uh, and so the kinds of flows of voters from one party to another uh, in the U.S. are different than they would be in a place like Austria or Germany. But if you look at the sorts of places that Trump turned, places like Michigan and Wisconsin, they're not very different from northern France or northeastern France uh, in pl places where Le Pen won more than 50 percent of the vote. And the grievances are similar. And Trump has also employed this sort of civilizational rhetoric that targets Muslims, that blames Muslims. And quite frankly, he's been much harsher than than most European leaders in, in the policies that he's promoted, including the, the travel ban and, and others like it. And so we see something very similar going on in this country. The consequences are slightly different because of our political system, but he did manage to essentially hijack an established party from within and win an election. Sasha Polakov saransky I want to thank you for joining us from New York. I want to thank as well Roland Tishy for being uh, with us from uh, uh, Bavaria, from Tronstein, Barbara Kolm in uh, Vienna, Hannah Starman, François Lafont. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next.